congratulations. Gilad, uh, may I just add that his supervisor, uh, Mayor Khatina, uh, from his department, and Daphna Efra from uh, the Open University. And if I'm not mistaken, Daphna was a student of uh, Nehemia, that's you, right? So you have a close circle. Yeah? Okay, nice. Okay, so far we have spent something like 45 minutes, and that was the appetizer, huh? because now we go to the main dish. And I can promise you that it will be an excellent dish. And let me introduce our speaker. I have here a very long list, which I'm not going to read. But uh, uh, Professor uh, Edhem Eldem, he is from uh, the Department of History, School of Arts and Sciences, Boazici University. Bosphorus University, and there is a long list of publications, and I saw quite a few books which were written in three languages, uh, Turkish, French, and English. And uh, um, because that's a long list, I'm not going to read it. Uh, the last one he edited, uh, which is called Scramble for the Past, a story of archaeology in the Ottoman Empire between 1753 and 1914. I would just add one more thing, that uh, Professor Adhem is curator of uh, the, uh, was the curator, right? No longer. Of uh, the Ottoman Bank Museum, and he was responsible for quite a lot of exhibitions. There's a long list that I'm not going to mention, but I think this is a very important part of his CV Anyway. So his lecture, you can see here the title of his lecture, Osman Hamdi Bey and Islam, Art, Science, Orientalism, and Less Science, and show that we are going to enjoy it. It's, it's a great honor, a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the Lexion Center, uh, to, uh, uh, to the family, uh, to the organizers, Yat, uh, and to A.I. Dino, who is uh, involved in things Ottoman in this university, and uh, is apparently part of the uh, decision to bring me here. I have to start with a number of, of disclaimers. Uh, I've never worked on Africa. Um, and uh, I've been through the impressive CV of Nehemia uh, Lezion, and uh, I've, I've noted that we had very little in common. I haven't even worked on Islam properly. Um, so um, you've heard a lot about financial difficulties. So I could say that uh, I am what you get on a tight budget. Uh, this is uh, as good as it gets on a, on a, on a tight budget. Um, uh, somebody who knows nothing about Africa and hasn't even worked on, on Islam. Um, but then again, uh, I looked at the, uh, at the CV and I, I heard some of the comments made by Amnon Cohen. And um, I, I can say that I do have something in, 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 in common with him. First of all, an unpronounceable name. Uh, that's always something uh, uh, and uh, I have a wife, too, um, and um, I'm proud to say that uh, in, in our career tracks, we've been through some institutions um, which we have in common. Uh, our paths haven't really converged time-wise, but at least uh, space-wise. I've been at the Wissenschaftskolle uh, in Berlin, like he has. I've been at the École des Hautes Études uh, en Sciences Sociales in Paris like he has. So at least I can claim to have some kind of a convergence uh, with, um, with Professor Nehemia Lefzion's uh, career. Um, but then again, uh, I'm going to talk about Islam in a very convoluted and perverted way, not through uh, art history, although it looks like a presentation that would have something to do with art history. I'm not an art historian. I'm a historian, full stop. 
but I'm interested in what art historians uh, have to say, especially with respect to one individual on whom I've, I've uh, worked uh, extensively and intensively, which is Osman Hamdi Bey. Um, now, uh, Gideon mentioned uh, that I had uh, recently published uh, with, uh, with some colleagues an edited volume on the history of archaeology in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, Osman Hamdi is part of that story in the sense that um, nobody here probably knows who he was, but he is some kind of a hero in uh, Ottoman history and especially in nationalist Turkish interpretations of Ottoman history. He's supposed to be the father of archaeology, the father of, of uh, painting also. He's one of the first artists. So he's some kind of an iconic image of the cultural renaissance of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, alla franca, that is in the Western uh, way. Now, whether he is a hero or not, or not is, is, is an open question, but he's an interesting guy. He's an interesting guy, and I've worked on him uh, not only through the, the lenses of, of uh, archaeology, but also through his biography. That's what I find interesting, to try to say something about uh, such a complex character, because he's a painter, he's an archaeologist, he's a museum director, he's what the French <coughs> call a touche a tout, um, a polymath with a little bit of a pejorative uh, connotation, in the meaning that he's done all sorts of things, he's an intellectual, who's played around with all sorts of things and never achieved anything fully. Uh, that's, I, I think, a, a good representation of where, where he stands. And I think that by 19th century standards, that's pretty much of a very common feature of most of the intellectual world, um, in, in, uh, in, not only in the Ottoman Empire, but even in, in Europe. So what I will try to do is look at how this individual looks at Islam, especially in his art. I could have added qualifying adjectives to what I uh, to the title. I mean, art, science, Orientalism, and blasphemy. I could have said some art, very little science, a lot of Orientalism, and a good dose of blasphemy. <laughs> that would have more or less summarized the way in which I'm going to present this this topic. Um, and what I find interesting in this case is that you can through one individual and his work, uh, try to analyze uh, the way in which Islam, which is you know, a huge concept, a huge uh, phenomenon, a huge reality, uh, can be analyzed in, a, in, a very interesting, in very interesting circumstances, those of westernization and transformation as typical of the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire. I don't have to give you a summary of Ottoman history, but you probably know that in the 19th century, from the uh, 1830s on, the Ottomans are westernizing, they're modernizing, and therefore they are gradually acquiring a very complex relationship to Islam as being, on the one hand, some kind of a national uh, 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 identity, but also an embarrassing form of backwardness with which they have to deal. Uh, Osman Hamdi is really at the center, at the epicenter of that vision, and you could even see in him, as I will show, some of the seeds of Kemalism, you know, a very die-hard, anti-Islamic uh, kind of position, uh, because of a desire to modernize, to westernize in a certain, in a certain way. So, uh, Osman Hamdi is, uh, as I said, I mean, he's a complex figure, but there are two portraits I like of him, uh, the archaeologist, and this is a picture that he had taken in 1883 when he discovered uh, Mount Nemrud, uh, the, uh, um, the tumulus of, uh, of Antiochus on top of uh, a mountain in eastern Anatolia. I like the pose because it's, uh, it's a conquering pose. It's really what archaeology is about. It's claiming, it's planting the flag, it's claiming a site in your name. And of course, it's a personal conquest too. So lying on top of one of these colossal heads is a way of stating, I made it. And I made it not only personally, but also in the name of my empire, of the Ottoman Empire, as recently appointed director of the um, Imperial Museum. It's a way of confronting, of defying a little bit this Western encroachment, uh, which is so present in archaeology. And on the right, it's Osman Hamdi 
a painter. This is in 1904-5, so he's much older, 1883. There are almost 25 years uh, between the two. But this is him in his studio uh, <coughs> finishing one of the paintings that I will uh, uh, talk about during this uh, presentation. So the artist and the archaeologist. Not really an archaeologist because he's not trained as one, but a genius when it comes to managing antiquities and managing uh, the Imperial Museum. Not an excellent artist, but one who manages to use his aura uh, as, uh, as the, uh, the manager of, of antiquities to promote his own art, especially in the West. So let's start with art. Art and Islam. Uh, that is Islam in Osman Hamdi's art. Islam is very present. I have to find an easier way of doing that. Um, uh, there are plenty of, of, uh, of paintings where, even though it's not explicitly Islam that he is portraying, he is he is depicting an environment that has some kind of a link to Islam. Uh, this is one of his early paintings. I won't go to the earliest phase of his life when he was a student in, in Paris in the 1860s and started painting. My idea that he is, uh, is that he, his real dream was to become a normal painter, that is, a bourgeois painter who would do portraits and whatever, but that he was forced, in a way, to become an Orientalist painter because he was praised for being, you know, like a saint savant, a Muslim who could paint. So that was something he was encouraged to do, and he finally realized that it worked fine, because that's how he sold his painting. So um, in the 1880s, he has this uh, genre he develops, which is generally a domestic interior with women, men, in some kind of an ageless and frameless interior that you can recognize as being Islamic slash Ottoman because of the tiles and whatever and with some objects that do denote an Islamic presence. The book that is open on the, on the lectern there, on the Rahle, is, is nothing. I mean, anybody who knows about the Quran will see that this is not a Quran. I mean, there are no Qurans with only four lines on a page. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And especially if you look at the detail, there, you'll find that it is Hamdi. Uh, the second, the second uh, uh, um, line, uh, you can read the hum. And this is something he did a lot. He signed kind of uh, elusively in, in, um, in the uh, decorations. And so it's really a very detached way of introducing Islam as just part of the furniture, in a sense, in an environment that is uh, essentially uh, Ottoman. Sometimes the dose of Islam is a little bit the dose of, say, religiousness, is a little bit increased, especially when he does, and he's, he's got at least five or six versions of this painting, which is one particular turbe, one particular mausoleum in Bursa, uh, that was Mehmet I, Chedevi Mehmet, one of the early sultans, and this is a depiction that he makes of people praying in presence or reading in presence of that very highly decorative uh, um, catafalque, the, uh, the cenotaph of, of Mehmet uh, Chedevi. All the objects that, he, uh, that surround the, uh, the catafalque are museum objects. They don't exist in the original turbe. They are part of the museum's collections, early collections, and you can see, still see some of these in the um, Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts in, in Istanbul. So again, there is some kind of a collaging of objects and an environment that contribute to giving this authenticity to uh, the scene. Again, the 1880s, a depiction of some kind of fictional and timeless. You cannot date them. I mean, you cannot really say this is the 18th century or the 16th century or whatever. It's ageless. In that sense, it's already Orientalist. Uh, you know, a man smoking his chibuk, his pipe, uh, in presence of uh, some kind of a servant who uh, brings him a, a, a cup of coffee, or a sultan-like person coming out of one mosque, and we know that this mosque is the Muradia in, in, in Bursa. So again, assembling objects that 
for themselves speak of a certain cultural and a certain uh, um, religious context, but are assembled to form some kind of a scene that has no deeper uh, connotation. Sometimes you can date them in the sense that he also uses uh, contemporary scenes. That is, uh, if you look at these women standing around uh, what is uh, the, uh, the walls of Sultan Ahmed Mosque in, in Istanbul, you can date that to the 1880s. This is what is called the Ferrage. It's the typical uh, costume of ladies of Constantinople, ladies of Istanbul during that time. But the scene is completely invented. Uh, the colors are, are, are selected for uh, the, the charm that it gives to the scene. So again, it's a manipulation, if you want, of uh, the scene. And it's almost like a parallel of you know, Parisians uh, strolling the boulevards, and this would be uh, the Stambulites uh, strolling on the, on the uh, Hippodrome. Again, as I said, that's another version of the same Turbe revisited with something that is totally unlikely, that is, to women praying uh, by the cenotaph. But the problem is that he never ex exhibited his paintings in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire, but always in foreign lands, especially in Berlin, Paris, London. So he could get, get away with all sorts of inventions without ever being uh, questioned. Um, on the right side is a painting that he first exhibited in Berlin, which depicts two, uh, two imams, hojas, call them whatever you want, who are discussing in what seems to be the interior of a mosque. And indeed, it is the Yishin, the Green Mosque of Mosa, which he visited in the 1880s, and which he sketched. And he's using it, uh, mostly from photographs, to create a scene. But what's interesting is that you can, uh, I'll, I'll show you other examples of that. But uh, again, um, the Muratiye Mosque in Bursa, or the Turme of Selim the I uh, in Istanbul, become the scenes for contemporary street scenes, supposedly street scenes of, of Istanbul or of Bursa. They're never really identified. I mean, it takes the work of a, an art historian to really <laughs> identify these buildings, because it's always a fraction of the building. It's not the building uh, itself. It's the building as a symbol, as some kind of a theater setting, um, very orientalist in that sense, that gives a, a context to uh, the scene. By the 1900s, he goes into more focused studies uh, the difference being that he tends to focus on one central person, one central character, and the, uh, the role, the identity is a little more marked. Here, a theologian, if you want, in St. Jerome's pose, you know, thinking uh, over a book. So it's, it's really a theme that is taken from a very Christian uh, kind of, of uh, iconography, but adapted to an Ottoman context with the surroundings that are bit by bit constructed in order to give the impression of an authentic Islamic Ottoman uh, um, uh, environment without giving too much detail. The tiles, uh, the rahle, the lectern, um, you know, the window uh, panes, the, uh, the Quran, of course, and some books. So really it's, it's uh, like photoshopping, and I'll, uh, sh uh, I'll, I'll uh, show you examples of that photoshopping, uh, knowing uh, very well what the objects are, and assembling them to create a scene. Again, uh, from the 1900s, the same kind of construction. A fragmented interior with one central character, obviously explicitly uh, um, uh, described as, as Islamic, but in fact that you cannot identify in any way time-wise or uh, role-wise. You cannot, for example, say that this guy is a dervish of this or that order. There's absolutely nothing real in the depiction. It's just an oriental garb. And the fact that he is in a turbe is something that gives him some kind of an air of, 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 uh, of penetration of, of, of Islam, and the gesture is completely inco incomprehensible. I mean, who lifts his hand? I mean, people working on the Sufi orders may have other ideas, but you know, this is not a normal uh, uh, attitude. Go into, it's like, you know, it doesn't make sense. Or 
reading in front of a fountain, now I'll show you the fountain later, reading from what seems to be a holy book is again very contextual, but in fact relies on practically no uh, hard evidence uh, whatsoever. One of his masterpieces, it's his son posing as some kind of an Indian prince, Oriental prince, what we don't know. I mean, this is something that he, uh, he exhibited in, in Paris in 1905, and then in London in 1906, and it was bought in 1906 by, um, uh, by, the, um, by an art gallery in Manchester, so it's now in England. But what's nice about this is that uh, the first time it was exhibited in Paris, uh, the, the, the catalog said, jeune homme lisant la Bible, a young man <laughs> reading the Bible. So, you know, I mean, what were they thinking when they did the catalog? Then it was corrected, but then again, this man is reading what seems to be the Quran, but as you would read some kind of fashion magazine. I mean, this is not how you read the Quran. This is, so it's an attitude that is nonchalant, and that's very, very, uh, very, disconnected with the reality of Islam that we know it, but that fascinates Europeans. And of course, when you have little details like uh, the, the tiles and uh, the, the candelabra and whatever, it becomes a very authentic uh, representation.